in that case then, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Richard Brown. I'm going to be here talking about my, the micro S desktop and everything we need to really take it to the next level. Um, now you see my face, it's going to disappear because I'm going to replace it with the slides. I love how this works perfectly fine. There we go. All right, so uh, first a little bit about me. Um, I've been in well in OpenSUSE since it began and you know doing lots of other open source stuff. Um, for the last seven years, I've been working at SUSE, doing lots of various bits and pieces with QA and, and, and other stuff. And for the last couple of years, I'm in the future technology team where I'm working on MicroOS and Cubic, mostly in OpenSUSE. Um, this isn't the only talk about the MicroOS desktop. So tomorrow, uh, Dario has a talk, you know, basically with practically the same title, which I swear we both did by accident, um, which is, you know, can MicroOS desktop be your daily driver? And like he says in the, the title, spoiler alert for him, at least, yes. So what's the point of me talking about all of this? Well, Dario's proven in his talk that, you know, that he would give tomorrow that, you know, it's a perfect daily driver for him. And, you know, he's a great developer. He's fine with tinkering. You know, we need to do an awful lot of work to really make it a daily driver for everybody else. Um, or more people. Um, I explain why I ripped out the, the everybody later on. And we need more help to make this happen. This entire presentation is a plea for help to try and get more people interested. Um, so it isn't just like three people moving this whole idea forward. So what is micro OS? Um, every time I kind of dis decide to talk about this, I end up changing my mind and I don't want to talk about what is micro OS first. I want to talk about why is micro OS. And at its heart, you know, micro OS is our response to the fact that computers aren't just the laptops and desktops and servers that we've had for the last 25 years. You know, there, you know, there's far more interesting devices out there, everything from Raspberry Pis to IoT devices to you know, computers embedded in cars and airplanes and all this stuff. And even when you look at laptops, desktops and servers, you know, people aren't necessarily using them the same way that they, they have for the last 30 years. Um, sort of one of the classic examples is like this IP webcam, you know, there's thousands of them out there. Has anybody ever updated the firmware on them? Well, they probably should have because like 78% of malware out there is due to botnets, you know, running because these devices aren't being updated. And one of the reasons these devices don't get updated is because the manufacturers are terrified about a failed update making many, many unhappy customers. And there's reasons to be worried about that. Like, I, I come from the UK. Uh, a couple of years ago, like the UK uh, O2 mobile network had an absolutely massive network outage and it's because they pumped out a firmware update to all of their cell towers and then the firmware update basically bricked all of their cell towers and unfortunately that also meant they didn't have any way of putting a new firmware update to fix all of their cell towers so a poor and poor engineers had to go out to every single location for every single o2 cell in the uk and manually reflash the firmware which was incredibly expensive and incredibly time consuming and, you know, lots of very unhappy customers and lots of very unhappy people, you know, all because they didn't have some way of sort of automatically rolling back the update when it went horrifically wrong. So in this new world, you know, it's not just a case of you know, desktops and servers anymore. You know, we have the cloud where people can just, you know, throw a credit card at their favorite cloud provider and get more hardware for any of their servery stuff. You have IoT devices everywhere, all doing this sort of single one job, be it like a sensor or like a Raspberry Pi, where they can only really do like one thing easily anyway. You've got virtualization, which also kind of encourages this sort of one job mentality. You know, you have a VM, that VM does one job. If you need a, another machine, well, if you need to, that to do something else, you don't pack like we would used to, you know, just add another package from the existing server. You typically fire up another VM to do that, that second job. Um, and this sort of very modular, just keep on adding more services approach, you know, is also what you see in containers where, you know, containers also give you this sort of added approach of limiting, limiting incompatibilities by isolating services. 
On the desktop side of things too, you also see trends like this, especially in the US, where like in, in education, like 60% of students now are not learning on a traditional desktop. They're not learning on a Mac. They're not learning on, on Windows. They're learning on a Chromebook. Um, and yeah, that's not a trend that you see everywhere in the world yet. But if you do look at you know the rest of the world, you know that Chromebook market is growing very, very quickly. And the Windows market is shrinking, and that Windows market is not shrinking at the expense of Linux. You know, the Linux market you know, is that tiny little yellow slivers you see on the, the bars there. And on the last bar, it practically disappears. You know, it's it's iOS, it's Chrome, it's Android that are, are growing in that education market. And, you know, for those of us who kind of lived through the computer revolution, you know, it was schools first that really drove a lot of those changes because, you know, once a student has learned something at school, that's going to be what they want to expect to use in life business. Can anybody else hear me? <laughs> Good, fine, wonderful. I just noticed a chat message, so that's all good. So regular Linux is not good enough. Um, and, and, you know, to kind of paint everything in, in broad strokes, you know, regular Linux distributions are all like Swiss Army knives. You know, and that's that's how we've built them. It's also why we built them, to be these Swiss Army knives. So you've got tons of tons of different components which can all be swapped out interchangeably. Um, it's not focused to do any one particular thing. And, you know, these lots of services and features, you know, while they're great and, you know, just like your Swiss Army knife, it's, you know, can do everything. It doesn't necessarily mean it can do one thing perfectly. And you end up with the sort of increased chance of incompatibilities between services, which is the, the pain that distributions deal with when they're building it. And in production, when you're running it, you know, a problem with service A can easily impact a service B, C, D, etc. You know, cascading failures are never fun, but they're a real risk with traditional Linux being used in traditional ways. And so we've made microOS. And I'm talking about this a little bit more in my uh, my later presentation today as well. But at its heart, you know, microOS is OpenSUSE's answer to the you know, targeting this new world. You know, so at this at its absolute heart, it's a predictable and immutable operating system. You know, once you deploy it, you cannot alter it during runtime. The root file system is read only. Nothing's going to change while the system is running. It's therefore, well, partly because of that, it's very reliable, but also, you know, you do have to update it at some point. So when you do update it, you know, it is auto, it, it is automated or, or yeah, automated by default or automatic, automatable if you want to not have it by default. And any other, once those updates are automatically applied, system automatically reboots, system automatically figures out has the update worked the way it should have, system automatically recovers if the update didn't work right. So you can really guarantee that you know, it's going to keep working. And part of that, again, keeping with that reliability is, you know, the less things on the system to go wrong, the less things can possibly break. So we keep microOS as small as possible um, for that kind of general use case of it doing one job. Um, and therefore, after that, we expect that things like, well, all the applications, all the services are meant to be coming from something like containers or sandbox. Potentially, you could also just use microOS with like one job being you know, a binary that you've added on there and done. You don't have to put things in containers or sandbox, but that's really the, the mindset and the philosophy behind what we've done with microOS. The architecture for OpenSUSE and microOS is, is a little bit different. It's a distribution without a separate code base. So we actually build microOS as a separate distribution, as a separate ISO. It's got a different product name. There's different... Uh, QCO images and VM images and all of that stuff. But everything is actually built as part of Tumbleweed. We build it in the factory project with the rest of Tumbleweed. We test it in OpenQA with the rest of Tumbleweed. The, the release process is completely indistinguishable, which is great because that means if I break anything in microOS, I stop all of Tumbleweed being released or just as likely, you know, if Tumbleweed has a bad day, microOS doesn't release. So we never, we're always yeah, keeping each other in check and also making sure that neither sort of side of the coin breaks each other, which also helps keep everything nice and reliable. The idea of the microOS desktop basically started about this time last year when I did a presentation uh, that didn't have any slides. I was just kind of on stage ranting about, wouldn't this be a cool idea? Um, but yeah, at its heart, it's taking that microOS idea and then like, why don't we just make that one job being a desktop? 
Now, that question leads to like a whole bunch of stuff. Like, you know, a desktop isn't a nice, simple thing that you can containerize. Um, and so what it's evolved to since then is really taking the micro OS basic system and then expanding it so the micro OS desktop includes a minimal base system with a desktop environment of your choice and the basic configuration tools for that desktop environment, the things like the GNOME control panel and the KDE sort of basic suite of tools for you know configuring the thing. And then everything else, applications, browsers, LibreOffice, etc., are all expected to be coming from flat packs from FlatHub. Um, or app images if you want or whatever but typically speaking as a project we're very much focused on using FlatHub by default who is this for well it's not for everybody like if you're perfectly happy with tumbleweed and your leap desktop cool fine you know great you know we're, we're not there to kind of dislodge anything that people are doing there um, but I, I find myself as an increasingly lazy developer I don't want to have to hack around on my tumbleweed desktop or even a leap desktop the way that I used to, you know, I, I just want to have a machine that just I can rely on that's always going to have the same packages on it and it's going to update itself and it's going to reboot itself. Um, and yeah, there's some applications where I, I really care about having the latest version and, and getting all that right. But those are, you know, in many cases, those are applications I'm already running in flat packs. Um, so yeah, in some respect, you know, the micro desktop is for yeah, folks like me, you know, lazy developers. Um, but also, you know, this concept really should appeal to that same audience that are, are really being attracted more and more to the sort of the iOS, the Chromebook or the Android like experience where, you know, they're not, they don't want to mess around with the operating system. They just want to be given an operating system that works and it's automatic and reliable. But at the same time, you know, their end users, they're going to want to make sure they're running the, the correct latest version of LibreOffice. They want to make sure that they're running the latest browser. Um, and that kind of thing works very, very nicely when upstream projects are already packaging that stuff already in flatbacks. So like, why not just use that? Why do we don't need to reinvent the wheel? We don't need to package and maintain all of that again separately. So as a project, sort of my overarching goals that I want to see microOS sort of reach this year is, you know, it should be reliable, predictable, and immutable, just like regular microOS. It should be less customizable than Tumbleweed and Leap. Like that's that's a core goal. Like Tumbleweed and Leap are wonderfully customizable. We're looking for something that's more kind of refined out of the box and you know, less to go wrong, hopefully. Um, but not too much less to go wrong. So one of the biggest problems we have with MicroOS right now is it's small and it's probably a little bit too small. You know, we don't want it to be small at the expense of functionality. We want printing to work. We want gaming to work. We want media production to work. And use cases like that you know, do need to, uh, uh, yeah, do need to you know, have drivers and stuff enable to enable that that on the base system, um, and so you know some of those things are missing right now or not quite configured the way they should be. We want to add that. We want to fix that. Um, someone just asked, you know, what about thin client kiosk type uses? Yes, perfect for that as well. Um, you know, that's definitely a, a perfectly valid use case for that. Um, but you know, you'll need to have some, it, the lockdown wouldn't be the problem. That's actually really easy because there's not really much to lock down. The trickiest part would actually be making the applications or services available you want like right out of the box, but I'll be talking about that in a second. And yes, you know, we want the desktop to just work straight out of the box. No, yeah, no tinkering, just, you know, just like you get when you get an Android device or an iOS device, you know, you turn it on the first time, it boots, it works. Um, I'll, I'll answer Lubosh's question later because, yeah, he kind of, he's asking questions that I want to answer about in the slide. Um, and yeah, there's other questions running into the chat. I will, I will promise to answer them all later. Um, the desktop status at the moment, you know, it is, it is like the main micro OS. It is doing the whole reliable, predictable, mutable stuff perfectly fine. And it is less customizable. Like I said, you know, it's small and it's maybe a little bit too small now. So I'm definitely not happy with, with reaching the goal there. You know, we're not able to get everything running. Um, printing was added like this week. So, you know, printing's there now, um, but we don't really have sort of any success or test or really active, active testing on things like gaming and multimedia and media production, that kind of thing. And yes, this, none of this is working out of the box right now. As you'll see when you go to Dario's session, you know, he has to do a whole bunch of stuff on a fresh installation to get it all up and running. We want everything like that to be 
done, dusted, automated, so the whole thing just works. The Coven team, there's only about three of us working on this at the moment. Uh, Fabian is taking care of the KDE side of things. Dario is mostly taking care of the GNOME side of things, and I'm the release engineer for MicroOS, so I'm juggling those submissions, and I, I also do a little bit of the GNOME stuff on the side as well. But there's room for like way more, like you know, Fabian, Dario, I all need more help. We we don't have enough time to to do everything we want to get done here. We have nobody working on open QA tests right now. That would be lovely. We don't have anybody kind of looking at it from sort of a UI UX point of view and like making sure that everything makes perfect sense there. Um, you know, we'd love people to be going out there talking about this more, advocating for it, marketing what we're doing. Um, we've got KDE and GNOME right now. Do we want other DEs? That's a question I'll come back to later. And if anyone has other ideas, like we see in the chat asking about things like kiosks, you know, yeah, why not? We, we, you know, if you're willing to help and willing to help us do it, then you know, this is a lovely project to kind of get your teeth into because it is very open-ended where we could take this. Top issues generally, this kind of affects every variant of microOS desktop at the moment, is you know the out-of-the-box experience is you know imperfect. Like I said, Dario is talking about that mostly in this session. You know, there's too much configuration required. You have to add the flat hub config yourself. You have there's no default flat packs apps there. Um, you know, yeah, we want all of that to be tweaked, tuned out. So, you know, you just get a decent system that works as soon as you install it. There's no UI for transactional updates in any of the desktop environments right now. So, you know, the system automatically updates, the system automatically reboots, and it doesn't really tell the user what it's doing. <laughs> um, it would be very nice either to have transactional update integrated with package kits somehow, or to maybe have some alternative notification which, which it, that like, at least just tells you, you know, hey, there's an update pending. Hey, I'm going to reboot this evening. Or, you know, when you next reboot, you're going to get all these updates. Yeah, something like that. Um, the policy kit rules um, that you know we're currently using are way too stringent than you really want for a desktop environment. So you get like a bunch of root password prompts that you really don't want, like when you turn the machine off. And at the moment, we don't have any VM or appliance images. So to kind of ask Glubosh's question about how do you install it, um, you download the microOS ISO, the, the regular microOS ISO that does all the other microOS stuff. And there is a, uh, you know, you in, you boot up that. It's a standard YAS installation, just like Tumbleweed, just like like Leap. And there is an option there for the microOS desktop for KDE and the microOS desktop for GNOME. And the installation process is it's very much like a standard OpenSUSE desktop, just with less questions because we don't need quite as many questions and things to work there. Um, Top issues on the KDE side right now. I'm not as up to speed on this, so I just kind of asked uh, Fabian what he's working on, and this was like the one that he's most annoyed with at the moment. And that's Discover, which you know seems to be like when you remove the, the package kit zipper backend and you just have it set up a flatback, it seems like way more unstable than usual and crashing like crazy. So he'd really like somebody to have a look at that. On the GNOME side of things, which both I and, and Dario are using more, um, I, I actually did a fresh installation before doing this presentation, and that's when I realized that sometime between the last time I installed it and now, um, something's gone wrong with the, the dependencies for the uh, the icon theme. So you end up with an installation that has no icons and everything's a question mark. Um, I was going to fix it for this presentation because it's like a really simple one-liner. Um, there's the patterns micro s package which i'll talk about more later and like anybody could just add that there to the known pattern and it'll fix it right away but i decided to actually leave it open and leave it broken because you know it's a perfect like first time contribution to anybody who wants to dive in with this so you know i'm gonna leave it a week or two hopefully people see this presentation hopefully it stays broken yeah hopefully someone dives in and fixes it so i don't have to fix it in a week or two um, at the moment, by default, when the thing starts up, um, RPMs and the like are still being shown in GNOME software, um, and things like Flatpak aren't. You know, we, we want that to be rem you know, removed and tidied up, so you know the RPMs aren't showing there, and only the Flatpaks are showing there. Things like system mounts, so all of the BTFS subvolumes are showing in Nautilus. I have absolutely no idea why that's happening, because um, it doesn't happen on a regular Tumbleweed or a regular Leap machine and things like the dock are not populated with any key tools so you know like you get nautilus on the dock and you don't have like gnome software which probably should be there as well as any default installed flat packs when we start default installing flat packs 
there this is just yeah kind of an open question um you know gnome and kde makes perfect sense for like the ios android chromebook use case but when you look at uh, what some some developers might want you know incredibly geeky ones in particular you know who might want like a really trimmed down window manager like experience um and you see what the uh, the sway team are doing um, where they've got you know open SUSE sway with wayland and a very nice window manager all tightly integrated and packaged really well um i'm kind of curious at the idea of you know maybe there should be a sway variant of, of micro s which is like really, really, uh, for micro s desktop like really focusing on on that kind of developer use case and that also might be an interesting idea for, for things like kiosks because you know it's going to be sim even simpler to lock down nothing there just you know load up the application job done on the flip side though you know I've, it's an open question of you know do we need to have all these multiple desktops? You know, for the iOS Android Chromebook use case, you know, even just asking a user, do you want KD or GNOME is a scary choice. Um, and if I look at where the project is right now, you know, most of the attention, most of the users, most of the contributions are all around the GNOME variant. Um, and there isn't really much, but I don't know if a single user actively using the KDE one, and there isn't really that much contributions I'm seeing on the KDE side of things either. Um, so it kind of is a sort of the op the opposite open question. You know, should we just focus on GNOME and not bother with doing multiple desktops? Um, it's an easy one to answer. If you feel no, then contribute because I'm not going to like start dropping desktops if no, you know, if people are working on it. Um, but if we don't see more contributions on that on things like Sway or KDE, you know, I can very much easily see that you know as we get the GNOME one more and more polished up anything else might drop away as, as just not really viable because it doesn't have the contributions behind it. If you're interested in contributing, there are really like three key places to, to, um, to dive in and get involved. There's the patterns micro OS pa uh, package, in, which is in develop Quebec. That's where these desktop patterns are. So things like packages missing, drivers missing, yeah, you know, features missing that you don't want. It's really a simple case of like, OSC branching that package, adding the correct packages that you want to either the KDE or the GNOME pattern, um, or if you want to add a different desktop, adding a different desktop pattern there first, um, and then submitting that. And I'll review it and I'll send it to factory. And there we go, done. Um, that's yeah. At the moment, that's where most of the, the work is is going into because mostly it's a case of of adding and removing packages that need to be there. Um, for something that's like a little bit more extensive, like uh, changing the partitioning arrangement, um, which is something that we're thinking of doing, because like right now it's inheriting the system, the partitioning arrangement from, from uh, yeah, uh, well, sorry, it's receiving the partitioning arrangement from regular microOS, which is very container orientated, and you know users don't write to var quite as much when it's their desktop; they write to home far more. So maybe the partitioning makes more sense to have home as a much bigger partition. Um, so for things like that, or for adding a new system role, so adding like a full-blown new variant like Sway, um, you also need to modify the, the control file. This is the, the file that Yast uses to run through Yast. Um, that's in GitHub. If you send a pull request there, I'm the reviewer for it. I can review it, help you with it. So, you know, nice and easy to, to get involved there. Uh, and also, so will the entire YAS team because they also co-maintainers of that. So it's kind of, yeah, a nice, easy place to dive in if you're doing something more extensive. And then if we want to do something other than the traditional ISO installation approach, like I really had, like this idea of having like a USB stick, which just boots up and finds the hard disk on the machine and, nukes it with a pre-configured image of, of OpenSUSE microOS desktop. Well, the, the OpenSUSE microOS package in Devel Cubic Images is where that needs to be done. Um, there, we already have all of the other microOS and Cubic Images there, so there's plenty of examples to see. There's also actually a self-installing one, so it does everything I just said, but it does it for the regular microOS, not for the microOS desktop. So if people want to, to do that, then that would be very nice to see the contribution there and yeah we all, everything in micro OS kind of originally started as, as part of cubic so we're currently using the cubic mailing list and not anything separate so please feel free to join us on that mailing list 
um, or in the Cubic IRC channel, um, or just you know send the submissions straight in. So Devote Cubic is, is where most of this micro OS stuff is, but for the other stuff like GNOME, KDE, etc., you know, Factory is is yeah also where all that stuff's moving around and and the like. Now I have five minutes left, and there's a whole bunch of questions, so forgive me, but I'm going to scroll up and see what hasn't been answered by other people in the chat. And cool. And people keep on sending new messages, so it scrolls down again. Give, please give me two seconds. <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, I've answered the question about kiosks. Uh, for Lubosh, Lubosh asked, you know, how does the installation look like? It installs just like Yast. Um, and then he asked something about flat packs, but somebody else messaged again, so it scrolled down. Um, yeah. Uh, he then also asked, w um, will apps be installed from FlatUp as part of the initial installation process? That's something I would very much like to see. Uh, Sid's asked, you know, what about snaps? Um, simple answer. If you're asking me, I don't want anything to do with snaps ever. Um, and, and I really do not like the idea at all. Um, if somebody else wants to maintain it, you know, good luck. You know, so, you know, I'm like, you know, if I don't have to touch it, then fine. Uh, and yeah, somebody said, you know, it should be small, but all the stuff should work, which sounds like a contradiction. It, it's a challenge. It's a balancing act. You know, we want it as small as it needs to be to do all of the stuff. So it's not going to, it, we don't want the installation to be big and bulky and, and like all the bells and whistles that um, the tumbleweed and, and leap have out of the box. And also for going, if we're going down the road of something like with FlatUp, they have a lot of the drivers in their runtimes already and, and that kind of thing. So we don't necessarily need to, and codecs and that kind of thing. So we don't need to throw quite as much into the base system. Um, so it's that balancing act. We want it to be as trim and as, as sleek as possible, but we don't want to like cripple it where it just can't do stuff. And seeing any other questions. Neil said he's already going to be looking at the uh, looking at the package kit stuff, which is nice. Thanks, Neil. And Axel asked, you know, well, why should I use Flatpak if the package is available in Tumbleweed? Well, it's a good question. Um, I, to be honest, my answer is I want Tumbleweed to have less stuff in it. That's kind of one of my long-term goals. I kind of like the idea of, of OpenSUSE caring about less stuff. Um, this is something that I talk about more in my presentation in a couple of hours. Um, but generally speaking, you know, I think we need to accept the fact that, that the world is moving quicker than we can keep up with. And so we have to pick our fights. And if we have this library of, of stuff which upstream is already packaging and upstream is already taken care of, then why the heck should we do it all again the second time? Like what extra value do we really bring to packaging our own desktop stuff? Um, that's a, a whole nother debate, I know, um, but you can come to my presentation later, shameless plug, and, and argue, argue with me with that there. Um, but really, for me, this is kind of the, the balancing act that I think we can strike with the micro desktop of, you know, we can figure out which bits we want to take care of and which we bits we do right. And we can then work better with everybody else where they're already packaging that stuff in a way that makes sense for them. And does anybody have any last questions before I tidy this up? Just for the just for the sake of the recording, I'll repeat the question: Is like has has uh, yeah has anybody reached out to like KDE or GNOME about like using this concept as like an official partnership distribution with with either KDE either project? Um, and the simple answer is no. Um, but it's something that I would like to do once we get those like checkpoints marked off on what I did on the slides. Like once K the micro S desktop is kind of ready for prime time usage, I think we're in a much better place to kind of reach out to others with that. Um, right now, with the amount of stuff you have to do, like just go to Dario's talk tomorrow, like 
I don't think it's really ready to show that to them. But that's it. Okay, then. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you at my, talk, at my other talk later on. Bye-bye.